I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 48, an interview with Rich Sommer. Well, if you were listening to our first anniversary episode last week, and you made it through to the Flashes section, I talked a little bit about Mad Men, one of my favorite shows on television, and I said I was hoping that we might be able to have an interview with one of the Mad Men cast. Well, I always try to keep my podcast promises, so you're going to hear a conversation I had with Rich Sommer, who plays Harry Crane on Mad Men, in about a minute or so. First, let me mention that Mad Men finished its first season last week. I thought it was spectacular. It has been renewed for a second season that will start next summer. And the first season will be replayed starting in November on AMC, which is the network on which the show is shown in its first run as well as in its reruns. I wanted to let you know that there really are no spoilers in the interview that I do, no major spoilers about the overall plot. There are a few things that we talk about regarding the Harry Crane character that take place at the end of the first season. So, you know, if you don't want to hear that, you pretty much can hear us beginning to talk about that. You can mute that or move fast forward. But again, I think in general you won't uh, find too many spoilers in this interview. So here it is. It's about 18 minutes, and then I'll be back with some flashes and some additional things. Enjoy. Delighted to have Rich Sommer here with me. Uh, he plays Harry Crane on AMC's Mad Men. And uh, you, my listeners, know that it's one of my all-time favorite shows. Rich, let's just jump in with something that I've been uh, talking about on some of my blogs. I have in my hand uh, a 1957 book. It was written by Isaac Asimov, who's one of my all-time favorite science fiction writers. Uh, The book is called The Naked Sun. And on the back, of course, there's a picture of Asimov. And he looks a lot like Harry Crane. And, you know, I've seen pictures of of you, Rich Sommer, and you look, you know, somewhat like that, but not as much as as Harry Crane looks like uh, Isaac Asimov. He could be his brother or or even... I don't quite have the uh, the sideburns, I think. (laughs) That's true. Actually, he grew the sideburns a little bit later uh, in the 60s. Oh, I think. Okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> surely this isn't coincidence. So, so how did uh, the, this visual, uh, almost clone quality come to be? Well, I don't know. I mean, I I, I have to imagine it, it might, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, it might be a little bit of a coincidence. I uh, I certainly never heard Asimov's name brought up uh in conjunction with Harry, actually, until I was noticing it as a recurring theme in your uh, in your reviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it, it, actually, what's kind of funny is I ended up getting, my dad sent me a picture from 1958 of his grandfather, um, who uh, worked at the phone company in uh, Grove City, Ohio, and, I'm sorry, of his father, my grandfather. And uh, I look also startlingly like him, the same bow tie, the same glasses, the same exact part in the hair. So I'm getting the feeling that there may have been a few people who, uh, it might not have been a, a very original look at the time, I'm thinking. Well, it, it's possible Asimov uh, saw your grandfather and was so impressed with what he That could like. be it. Yeah. That could be it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the but I mean the series uh, is meticulously uh, researched and um, you know down to the lapels on the jacket that you wear and the bow tie and you know just mm-hmm. the overall ambience. Uh, how was that? Because obviously for you 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 weren't alive in the 1950s. Uh, it, it must no. have felt like you were time traveling or something. Yeah, absolutely. I mean it was. Most of the suits that I ended up wearing, and and for most of the guys, were uh, were vintage suits that were straight out of the period. So we uh, we not only got to look the part, but certainly uh, endure the textures of the time and uh, the somewhat uncomfortable stylings of the time. You know, things were a little bit uh, tighter in places, and you know, zippers that went from about just below your 
chest to your knees and uh you know it, it is it is a very carefully crafted show but it is uh, there, there's a feeling of uh, the first time I walked onto the set you know our our entire office the Sterling Cooper offices are built on one stage built true scale so when you walk in the front door of the stage you're essentially walking in the front door of Sterling Cooper and the geography is all laid out you know where everyone's offices are they're all kind of in a line and and it is a very uh it was a very strange feeling it's always still strange to see people who work kind of behind the scenes on the show in their very 2007 clothes you know cargo pants and t-shirts and tool belts and then the the other people in costume walking around it it is a, a strange dissonance there must have been exciting now as far as you know the harry crane character was he deliberately crafted to to have a point of view say different from the other copywriters you know the other two guys obviously his position is, is going to be different than don draper's and you know some of the the higher ups but i did notice sure. some interesting distinctions there yeah i think um it was definitely crafted to be to be one of the kind of, uh, I, I, you know, he was, he was after, I mean, you, you know how the season ended with Harry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that one of the goals of the writers was to have the guy who was made throughout the whole season clearly made to be a moral uh, standout, you know, a guy who who did love his wife and, and stayed true to her. And, and even though he flirted with people, never crossed that line, to have him fall from grace as well. Uh, I think that was, of course, intentional. And, you know, Matt Weiner, the creator of the show, has said uh, to us and in interviews that a lot of the characters themselves, as they developed throughout the season, took pieces from our actual lives. You know, I'm of of the guys. I'm one of the only married ones. Um, And, uh, you know, Harry ended up being from Wisconsin. I'm from Minnesota. Uh, So little bits and pieces of kind of uh, my attitudes were, were put into the character. I haven't uh, cheated on my wife. That that was uh, <laughs> some inspiration found from somewhere else. But but otherwise, it did seem to be kind of loosely loosely pulled from our own persona. Well, I know what you mean about uh, playing and writing things that you want to do in a convincing way that may not be you. Uh, you know, as a science fiction author, I have occasion to write some pretty nasty people. And uh, you know, sure. you, you try to draw on your own experience, but uh, you just have <laughs> imagine, I guess, what you would do in that situation. Right. Uh, but uh, apropos of, of your wife on on the show, one thing which a, a few people were asking—I mean, it, it was sort of clear—but uh, obviously, on the on the final episode, poor Harry seems to have been thrown out of his. Uh, his home. So mm-hmm. we can assume that Harry told his wife about what happened uh, on the next to last show and his wife reacted adversely. Or... I think that's a fair assumption. Um, you know, we, we talked about it a little bit that, that basically somewhere in between episodes 12 and 13, Harry spilled his guts. Um, I, I choose to believe that he, he chose to tell her, um, some people still, you know, I mean, that's kind of one of the fun things about the show is because nothing is, I mean, rarely are things just set out in front of you and the whole story is told. There's plenty for people to kind of draw their own conclusions on. And I think that some people even even working on the show drew the conclusion that Harry was found out somehow, uh, maybe because he didn't come home that night and Jennifer was up waiting when he got home. Or I, I choose to believe that Harry knew from that moment that he woke up with with Hildy on top of him that he needed to tell Jennifer. Yeah, and it's certainly consistent with Harry's high moral mm-hmm. character, as as you were just uh, saying. Um, let's talk about something a little different, the smoke that's on the show, which is a, an incredibly important character in the show. I mean, I don't know if I was the one who said it, but a lot of people have mentioned uh, you, you could almost say that one of the stars of, of Mad Men uh, in, in addition to the characters is, is smoke and smoking and, and cigarettes because it was a, such a fundamental part of that time what, was that real right. smoke? So, I mean, were you breathing that in during the uh, actual shooting it's, of the show? It, it's actual 
smoke, um, but it's not, they're not real cigarettes. They are herbal cigarettes. So uh, it's, it's a, uh, well, there are two reasons kind of that we went with herbal cigarettes. One is the California workplace law that you can't smoke real cigarettes at the workplace. Um, and since this is our workplace, we couldn't do it. The other reason is it's better for us because the herbal cigarettes, while they taste awful and feel awful, um, they are non-addictive because they don't have nicotine in them. Yeah. Um, but they are truly disgusting. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, they are they, – I mean, we are actually inhaling smoke. It's just um, really not fun at all. Oh, no, that, that, that makes sense. I don't uh, smoke myself, but actually I, I read somewhere a few years ago uh, something that finally made me understand the appeal of, of smoking, and obviously it, it does have a lot of appeal, certainly back then and even now, it's, and it, it's that nicotine, unlike just about any other stimulant, has a, the dual effect of, of making you sharper, but also making you more relaxed at the same time. So, you know, unlike, unlike caffeine, which, you know, makes you sharp but not relaxed, or wine, which makes you relaxed but not sharp. So, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, a highly uh, appealing thing. Uh, apropos of, of, you know, 1960 and the extraordinary, uh, you know, attention to detail, just about everything, uh, at least as far as I can tell, was gotten precisely right. Uh, but I wonder if I could run a few things by you, and you can sort of give me your response, uh, both as an actor and what you might know about it. Um, sure. There was... Um, Joan was a great character, uh, in many ways one of my favorite characters, and uh, she actually was the voice of, of at least two or more things which were seemed a tiny bit out of context. One was uh, she said she was so over someone. Um, right. So, so how did that happen? I think she said she was so over. In 1960, I am so over you, right. I believe was the the line you're referring to. Um, you know, uh, uh, to me, now, again, I wasn't around in 1960. It did not sound so anachronistic to me, um, but it's also a phrasing that I've grown up with, so it would be hard for it to sound out of place for me, even even in a period piece. I've heard some people say that. I've heard other people say that they don't necessarily feel that way. I, I You know, I, I'm not sure. Uh it, did, it didn't strike me as odd, personally. Okay. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I get Matthew Weiner. I'm not sure how old he is. He's, you know, probably not that much uh, younger than I am. So he may have some, you know, memory of 1960. But um, sure. But on the other hand, you know, I mean, one of the things too, you, you know, you, you're out in California, and that sort of so constructionist classic valley talk. So it's possible that it might have been out in California then. But then again, the show takes place in New York. In New York. Sure. One of the other things that, you know, I was actually delighted to hear Joan say in one of the early shows, uh, you know, almost a throwaway line, the, the medium is the message. message. And yeah. uh, that, of course, comes from Marshall McLuhan. And um, I actually uh, researched the origin of that phrase. It's, it's actually best known from a book called Understanding Media that McLuhan mm -hmm. published in 1964. So that would be four years after 1960. But it turns out that McLuhan wrote a report for uh, the U.S. Department of Education in 1960, in which he does use that phrase for the first time. <laughs> so, well, that's good news, I guess. <laughs> I, had, I had heard, you know, I had heard a lot of people, you know, after that episode, of course, I, I'm, I, as you know, because I, I've read your blog, um, I like to read the things online about the show and, and just see what people are saying. And um, I remember that starting a little bit of a firestorm uh, when that episode first came out. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that your research has uh, proved <laughs> proved it a possibility. Um, but, but you know, for me, even even if you hadn't found that uh, smoking gun, I, this show is it takes place in 1960, but it's being made in 2007. So for me, <laughs> we're not looking to completely 100% like make a time machine. This, uh, this is how I look at it. Now, uh, this it may be incorrect, but this is, this is how I feel about it. I feel like we are looking at 1960 via 2007. And I feel like 
uh, things like like I, I know some people quibbled with the usage of a Dylan song uh, that came out in I think 1963 as, as the final moment of the final episode. Um, but you know, that, it's not like Don is listening to that song. It's just a piece of atmosphere for the audience to sort of hammer an idea home. And likewise, in I think the penultimate episode, when when uh, Don comes home and the election results are are on the TV, and Sally says, "Mom, Mom said I could ask you about the Electoral College," and Don says, "I don't think that's a conversation for children." I mean, to me, that is. That is clearly a wink at a 2007 audience. You know, mm-hmm. there, there are little winks at the 2007 audience, and I think that maybe the meeting is the message is one of them. Yeah, well, you know, there are lots of different issues there. Certainly, uh, you know, as far as using a Dylan song, Battlestar Galactica uh, ended their last season with a Dylan song, and uh, this takes place f- either far in the future or even perhaps in the distant past, nowhere near Earth. So sure. how did Dylan get out there? And actually, I, I, I agree with your analysis uh, about uh, Mad Men, because clearly that song uh, played at the end of, uh, of the finale episode was... Was, was sort of a meta piece. It was not something, it was not 100% clear that Don was hearing that. That could have been right. you know, something that was just sort of brought in as part of the packaging. And, and right. I, do think, I do think you make an important point. I actually got into arguments with people over the Tudors, a great show uh, that was on Showtime uh, this past season, because there there were some incredible liberties taken with, uh, mm-hmm. with the actual history. I mean, giving you know, Henry you know, one less sister than he actually had, uh, mm-hmm. having his son die much earlier. And actually, I was defending the show, saying, you know, history is a narrative anyway. In other words, even if you read a serious history book, you right. are you know, reading stuff that people are sort of putting together and piecing together. But I do think, actually, I think, first of all, Mad Men does a great job in doing this. I mean, so these, even these little examples, there may be less than 1% of, of the total amount of detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think part of the th- the thrill of the show, at least for me, is is seeing the accuracy of these uh, things. But, but again, that's just me. I, th- I think there's also a large audience uh, or a large part of the audience that doesn't care all that much, uh, you know, about sure. how specifically right it is. But I think, I mean, there is obviously a, a, a great effort made to keep it accurate, you know, as far as the set pieces and the look of the show and the feel of the show. But I think, you know, it's always important just to, I think, I think they go hand in hand. I think the accuracy is, is a vital, as you said, a character in the show. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, we're all, we're all kind of looking at it through the filter of 2007. Absolutely. Yeah, you can't help but do that. Well, we know what's uh, next for Harry Crane. Uh, the show uh, has been renewed. I'm delighted about that. But other than that, what's next for Rich Solmer? And, uh, you know, m- maybe a biography of Isaac Asimov. I would certainly recommend you for the part. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Paul. You write it, and I will seriously consider it. Um, I, okay. I <laughs> I think that would be perfect. Um, uh, you know, on the horizon, I'm just, you know, we're we're gearing up to, I think we start shooting sometime early in 2008 uh, for a, uh, a summer of 2008 return of Mad Men. Um, in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm doing that actor thing and, and uh, always keeping an eye out for stuff. I, I did a, actually Michael Gladys, who plays Paul Kinsey in mm-hmm. Mad Men, and I each did a small turn uh, as FBI agents in a uh, a film adaptation of Philip K. Dick's Radio Free Album Use that is um, currently being shot here in Los Angeles. And so uh, we're in two separate scenes, and we never meet each other, but uh, two of the guys from the Mad Men office are FBI agents in different points in time in that. So that's going to be fun. Excellent. Now, are you in character? In your, in your, do you look like your 1950s or 60s self? Or no, my... Uh, it's still period, but not quite so far back. I'm in 1981. Okay. So, uh, but I am I am smoking. I will say. So there's that. <laughs> well, a lot of people think you're smoking anyway. You know. It, it, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> no one would recognize me without a cigarette in my hand. So I have to, you know, try and keep my publicity. All right. Well, I may arrange, actually, uh, in addition to writing a biography, maybe I'll arrange for a special, you know, Isaac Asimov signing. <laughs> we'll oh, that sounds great. Yeah, to, to come by. And I think we could really make a good, a good amount of money with that. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, listen, you know, I think that you have really uh, done memorable work in Mad Men. You've done great work in a great show. And, uh, you, know, you know, apropos of time travel, I, I can see the future, and I predict this is just going to be the beginning of a great run for Mad Men and a great career for you. So, Thank you. I, I really appreciate it, Paul. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure, and uh, you can count on me watching next year and writing my crackpot reviews of every episode. I will. Re I promise I'll read them every week. All right. Thanks, Rich. Take care. Thanks, Paul. You too. The Light on Light Through podcast is proud to be part of the Blueberry Network. That's blueberry with no e's dot com. Hello, this is David G. Hartwell. I'm a senior editor at Tor and Forge Books in New York. I've been editing science fiction since 1970. I've edited a lot of people over the course of my career, but I'm pleased to also be the editor of Paul Levinson. I edited his first novel, The Silk Code, and I edited his most recent novel, The Plot Saves Socrates, and all the books in between. Entertainment Weekly says The Plot to Save Socrates is challenging fun. The New York Daily News says it's a Da Vinci-esque thriller. And Curled Up with a Good Book says Sierra Water is as sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. And thanks again, Rich Somer, a.k.a. Harry Crane. We're looking forward to the next season of Mad Men. Now, I mentioned a character, Joan, actually Joan Holloway, uh, in the interview. And I should also mention she's played by Christina Hendricks. And uh, actually, Joan, played by Christina, is my favorite female character on Mad Men. And that's saying a lot because there are a lot of excellent women, a lot of great performances on that show. But uh, Joan is great to look at. She says bright things like the medium is the message. So I'm one of her biggest fans. And I should mention, if you want to find out more about Mad Men, go over to amctv.com. There's a whole list of the cast, and there's a great discussion there that goes on about what's happening in every episode. And if you'd like to read any of the reviews that I do, and I review every episode, you can find those at infiniteregress.tv. Infiniteregress.tv. And then, last but not least, at levinsonnewsclips.com, I do uh, a podcast every once in a while reviewing a particular episode of a show, whether it's on Mad Men or on another series that I really love. So there's at least one review of a Mad Men show over on Levinson News Clips, and that's about five minutes. How about some fashion? Hey, if you're in New York City this Monday evening, that's October 29th at 7.30 p.m., I'll be hosting a staged reading of David Wiltsey's new play, Sedition. That's at 7.30. It'll be at Fordham University's Pope Auditorium. That's at our Lincoln Center campus on Columbus Avenue and 60th Street. And you can find out more about Sedition by going either to lightonlightthrough.com or infiniteregress.tv. I saw the play this summer early in August. I thought it was superb. It's a brand new play about a very old but unfortunately still very relevant topic. The trampling of the First Amendment by our government. And in the case of Sedition, it tells the story of a college professor who back in 1917 dared to speak out against that war and what he went through. My friend Mark Shanahan has the leading role in this live reading. I'll be there. Come on by if you have a chance. I think you'll enjoy the play. By the way, it's totally free. Fashion. This Tuesday evening, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time, I'll be a guest on Bob Mann's Let's Consider the Source. That's his XM Satellite Radio weekly program. And you can listen to it on XM 133. 
Here's a taste of what you'll hear. Dr. Levinson, thank you very much for being here on the program. I want to make sure I know where you're coming from. This is the one quote from you in the article in the Monitor. I'm not sure if you're looking for more regulation in light of this or less or no regulation. But basically, uh, all the rules just don't add up for the average viewer. Well, it's not that it doesn't add up. I mean, parts of it do add up. Uh, I think what does add up is viewers appreciate seeing realistic programming. And you can hear the rest of that interview this Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. on XM 133. Bob Mann's Let's Consider the Source. The interview takes about 25 minutes. And by the way, I was also interviewed this past week on Bill O'Reilly's Radio Factor. But that's a long story. I'll tell you about it on the next episode of Light On, Light Through. Promo. And that's the sweet music of our promo suite. And you're going to hear promos from Mike Thinks News, the savviest podcast in town. For Sean Farrell's patio book of my first novel, The Silk Code. For the Punk Horror Podcast. For the Ron Paul Podcast. And a new promo for a new podcast about journeymen. Listen, I had a great time talking to you. We're just about out of time. I look forward to talking to you next time. In the meantime, sit back, relax, and enjoy. the Mike Thinks podcast, www.mikethinks.com. News and current events with an opinion. The Mike Thinks podcast. It's the news you missed. www.mikethinks.com. The Locus award-winning novel by Paul Levinson comes to life in this free podcast novel. Journey into the ancient world witness the wonder of ages past and join Phil D'Amato in a struggle against forces both ruthless and unseen. Visit www.thesilkcode.blogspot.com to learn more about the author and the novel. And subscribe today at patiobooks.com. Coming to you every other week from Punk Horror Press, featuring The Punk and the Pastor, a movie review show featuring David Giannis and Stacey Campbell, and author Red Fiction, featuring the best in horror and punk fiction. Don't miss it. Subscribe now at www.punkhorror.com. Hey there, I hope you'll come over and check out the Ron Paul Fancast. It's a really great place for people who are fans of Ron Paul and for people who would like to know why we're all fans of Ron Paul. For the most part, this show is a show of testimonials. People like you and like me who want to share why they support Ron Paul. I hope you'll come and join us at ronpaulfancast.libson.com. So you already know about podcasts. You may already know about NBC's new show, Journeyman. Well, I'm, my name is Troy Price, and I do a podcast on Journeyman, and I invite you to join me. Watch Journeyman, 9 o'clock on NBC, and then tune in via iTunes Tuesday morning for reviews and laughs about the previous night's show. <laughs>